Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the breakout panels. Uh, I am joined here by two student presenters as well as the respondent, uh, Jill Finlayson. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce everyone all at once. Then we're going to move to the presentations. After the presentations, Jill will give her feedback to the students, and then we will open for audience Q&A. So first, I'm going to introduce Jill Finlayson. She is the Director of Expanding Diversity and Gender Equity and Tech Initiative at UC Berkeley, also called Edge in Tech. It's co-sponsored by Citrus, the Berkeley Engineering Department, and um, there's also uh, uh, there are also uh, stations at Davis, Santa Cruz, and Merced campuses. Uh, the Edge and Tech so, uh, initiative supports research and initiatives to support to, to promote the equitable participation of women in the tech industry. Uh, Jill has a strong background in strategy, entrepreneurship, and mentorship. Prior to Berkeley, she led mentorship and developed and delivered incubator and accelerator programs for Singularity University Ventures, whose mission is to increase the number of impact-focused fo startups to educate, inspire, and empower leaders. Uh, the first presenter, student presenter, is Erin. Uh, her topic is Worthy Enough, uh, California Relief Grants Battling Gendered Unemployment in the Pandemic. Uh, on the COVID pand the COVID nineteen pandemic, unlike others, uh, had a, has had a disproportionate effect on women in both employment and ownership sectors. California has poured billions into the economic and economic recovery of its businesses, but that still hasn't been enough to help all businesses. Erin's presentation will highlight the ways that the Cal Relief Grants continue to allow many businesses to slip through the cracks and uh, the trickle-down effect that it had on female unemployment and business ownership during the pandemic. Uh, the second uh, student presenter would be Allison. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention the internship office. So Aaron's internship office was Senator Mike McGuire. Um, Allison was at the California Department of Public Health. Her research topic is plan party planning businesses you absolutely need to know about. As the COVID-19 cases surged throughout 2020, birthday parties, weddings, and all sorts of celebrations were canceled. This is a study on how small businesses owned and operated by Latinx women within, within the event planning industry manage mental health challenges amidst COVID-19 uh, closures. So now we will begin with Erin's presentation. Hello. Um, I'm Erin, and I'm really excited to share my research from this summer with you today. Just to intro my path to my research question, um, I was seeing a lot of reports in late 2020, around December, um, about the disproportionate unemployment that was happening during the pandemic that was affecting women. Um, and I wanted to sort of investigate that further. Um, I wanted to see what sort of aspects of the pandemic led to an increased unemployment for women, why that was irregular, um, and sort of see whether or not that trend was reflected. It, it, I was seeing nationwide reports, wanted to see whether or not that was more reflected in California and whether or not that was mostly a trend of big corporations or small businesses or where, where all of that was coming from. So the research question that I wanted to address is sort of a two-part question. Um, the question is, what effect did the pandemic have on female unemployment and business ownership? Um, and did government assistance to small businesses help curb these effects? Um, most of the responses in the pandemic to the economy were to small businesses. So I figured investigating small businesses would also assist in helping to address the question of uh, unemployment as well. Um, so for the methodology I used in this project, I mostly relied on a literature review of news articles um, and other writing from journals that was coming out, studies that were being published at the time. 
um, and also some government databases relying on uh, real pandemic data, um, statistics, and that kind of thing. These are sort of a list of all the sources that I've used, and you'll see some of the data from these different sources come into play later in my presentation. Um, so some background information. Um, what happens in a normal recession? <laughs> a study published by the National Bureau of Economic Research explains that female unemployment isn't usually as affected by economic depressions as male unemployment. Um, they attribute this in part to women's role in the family, often as a supplemental income, uh, as well as composition in the labor force. Um, so of all women in the workforce, roughly 40% uh, are employed by countercyclical industries. These include industries like government, education, healthcare. Um, those do not usually experience high unemployment during normal recessions, um, and male unemployment in these sectors, conversely, is around 20%. Uh, and this is in contrast to highly cyclical industries, um, such as manufacturing, construction, and trade. These account for around 50% of all male employment, and make up around 24% of female employment and are highly fluctuating based on the cycles of the economy. Um, so this recession has been quite different. Um, the industries hit hardest by closures had a large impact on female unemployment. Um, these numbers are from the California Employment and Development Department. So in Los Angeles County, uh, the average difference of employment between March and April 2020, this first crucial month of the pandemic, was a decrease of 15.65%, um, whereas these industries highlighted below um, are more female-dominated industries and uh, had much higher rates of closure. So leisure and hospitality, accommodation and food service, arts and entertainment, and recreation all experienced closures of more than 40%. Child and daycare services decreased in employment by 32.5%, and female-dominated retail industries, clothing and accessories, decreased by over 50%. So, um, And it's not just unemployment. Um, this is from the Stanford Institute for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, between, the first, between the months of February and April 2020, roughly 1.4 million women-owned businesses closed permanently. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't also include that Minority-owned businesses faced incredibly disparate amounts of closures. Um, like Black-owned businesses closed at rates of 41% during these two crucial months. Latinx businesses decreased ownership decreased by 32%. AAPI business ownership decreased by 26%. This is all compared to white business ownership, which decreased by only 17%. Um, and intersectionality is definitely important to account for in this because women of color faced the most difficult challenges in the pandemic, receiving loans, um, which we'll get to later. So why this disparity between um, both female unemployment and female business ownership? Um, possible explanations um, that I've come across are daycare services um, as both a cause and a symptom of female unemployment, um, the ability to telecommute, and the industries that were hit hardest by the pandemic. Um, so to go further, um, these numbers are from the Pew Research Center. Um, child care responsibilities both faced high closures in a female-dominated industry. So previously, women who provided child care services faced high numbers of unemployment, as we saw before. But this also resulted in more issues for women <laughs> who needed to rely on child care responsibilities in order to conduct their own careers um, during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, we saw that 50% of mothers felt that they couldn't give full attention to their work because of childcare responsibilities, and 30% reduced their hours or left their jobs during the pandemic. I also just want to note that there is sort of a trend in social sciences to generalize that something affects women when, more accurately, it would be to state that it affects mothers. Um, and I think that just noting that childcare and the responsibilities that fell on women because of childcare, a mother specifically, um, played a huge role in female unemployment numbers in the pandemic. Um, additionally, the National Bureau of Economic Research explained that within occupations where telecommuting is an option, they did not, quote, observe the pattern of usual recessions, that women are more protected from men 
than men from unemployment loss. Um, so the ability to telecommute was also a hindrance uh, in job retention for women during the pandemic. Um, and so now going to talk about business closures um, and California and the, the Newsom administration really pushed um, response to business closures um, with through the Cal Relief grants. Um, just to overview what the Cal Relief grants were and who was eligible, um, small businesses as defined could apply to receive grant aid during the pandemic, ranging from $5,000 to $25,000. Overall funding totaled an estimated $4 billion over the multiple rounds of funding that, that they issued. Um, and businesses were eligible based on their annual revenue, given priority to base businesses, based on how they were affected by COVID-19 due to region and business sector. So these programs tried to aid sort of um, the disproportionate closures that we saw in female dominated sectors. Um, but still some sectors faced a lot of difficulty achieving these grants and still with those grants found it difficult to stay afloat with all of the closures. So this is a case study, um, an interview that I sourced from an article for Cal Matters about the closures affected, affecting women during the pandemic um, and specifically female dominated industries. So hair salons were a great um, example of the type of businesses that experienced really lengthy closures during the pandemic and were not really able like retail to pivot to an online business model. Um, and the owner of this salon says about receiving loans that they make it so complicated. They're constantly changing the rules. I mean, it's a nightmare. Um, and Russell's salon uh, kind of had to fight tooth and nail to stay open, but was lucky enough um, to retain uh, their business after receiving both a Cal Relief Grant and a federal PPP loan. Um, and this quote is from the LA Times. So far, this is from round one. So far, 198,000 small businesses and nonprofits have or will been awarded grants during the first round of the program. State officials estimate that around uh, 180,000 applications will remain unfunded. So this is from early in the program, but it's still staggering numbers that almost half of the applications went unfunded during probably the most crucial time of the pandemic when closures were high and customers were scarce. <laughs> the problem with the program that a lot of businesses were encountering was an oversaturated infrastructure that was unable to provide adequate support um, for business owners. Um, whether or not there was sort of a push for equity and loan disbursement, um, a lot of businesses were still unable to, either because of financial literacy, access to internet, access to resources, and financial advising, were not really able to access these loans in the most equitable manner. Um, so these quotes are from, these quotes down here are from the uh, Reddit slash small businesses um, in posts about the small uh, the Cal Relief grants. Um, one business owner complained that the uh, applications were a quote, absolute nightmare interface and others added that the website was a complete disaster, would not allow them to completely upload all of their necessary documents to qualify because everyone would kind of use the infrastructure at the same time and it wasn't able to support the amount of traffic that it sort of needed in order to help everyone. Um, so some conclusions. From my project, um, pandemic the pandemic created far too great a need to support for support from any government assistance to fully accommodate the closures. Um, industries hit hardest by the pandemic have put more more women out of work than any previous economic crisis, and the relief grant efforts were not enough to keep businesses alive and trickle down support to employees, um, especially in female dominated industries who could not pivot to an online format. Um, Addressing sector-specific closures, as the Cal Relief Grants tried to do, only focused on one issue caused by the pandemic and did not address other gender-specific issues relating to childcare and the ability to work remotely. 
and female-dominated industries and their employees will be feeling the effects of the pandemic for many years to come. So thank you. I want to thank Kalinsack and the CRB team and everyone for their guidance in this project. <laughs> We will now um, go to Allison. So uh, my name's Allison. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, like Nicole said, I'm a fourth year studying public health and public policy. And I really wanted to investigate how Latina-owned businesses and their mental health challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. So just a little bit about my motivations behind the study. I was living in Southern California during the pandemic, so I was able to witness how business closures really impacted small business. And this led to my focus on Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties. And more importantly than just being physically located in Southern California during 2020, uh, my own family business was required to shut down for a few months during 2020. And that really sparked my interest in really investigating the individual experiences, not only with entrepreneurship, but the policy challenges that COVID-19 brought forward. And in addition, I've been fortunate enough to participate in two qualitative research studies, one through the Berkeley School of Public Health and one through the UCSF Institute for Health Policy Studies. And both of these research studies really focused on qualitative interviews, so I wanted to hone in on this skill, and I really structured my interview around these prior experiences, and I wanted to do a deeper dive into mental health challenges such as stress, anxiety, cultural norms, and financial barriers. So just a little bit about what I want to address today, I want to go over the Hispanic population within the Orange County and Inland Empire area, the intersection between COVID-19 and small businesses, two different case studies of small businesses within Southern California and how we can move forward and support Latina entrepreneurs in the future. So just a little bit about the Hispanic population within Orange County. You can see that the Hispanic community makes up 32.2% of the entire county, and that is the second most populous ethnic group within that region. When we look at Riverside County, we see that the Hispanic population is actually the majority at 46.7%. And similarly, when we look at San Bernardino, we see that the Hispanic population is over 50% of the entire county. So what is this? mean overall we can see that the Hispanic community and the ethnic group overall is very well represented within Southern California at 32.2, 46.7, and 50.6. These are obviously a very large portion of the county population so it's important to keep in mind when we enact uh, county policies, state policies, local policies, they have a direct impact on uh, these underrepresented communities and for legislators uh, you know large businesses, uh, private interest, public interest, it's important to keep this uh, kind of ethnic breakdown in mind when we think about policy grant programs and really any kind of business plan we uh, want to implement moving forward. So now I really want to address COVID-19 and the interaction it had with small businesses and more importantly importantly, how pandemic closures impacted small businesses such as Latina business owners. So more specifically, I want to address the intersection of female entrepreneurs and policy implications such as the unintended consequences of COVID-19 and how that really did have an impact on not only the mental health of all small business owners, but in this case, particularly Latina owned businesses. So just a little bit about women in business in the, uh, like the numbers of women in business. Women-owned firms represent 37.2% of all businesses within the state of California, and they generate over 5% of the state's total business revenue. California also has the most minority-owned businesses across the entire country, and um, Overall, with all these numbers, we can see that supporting women and supporting women in business is very impactful, not just for the uh, economy of California, but also just the economy of the entire nation as a whole. So it's really important that we as um, you know, just society, as uh, legislators, as people in private interests, we learn how we can better support women and uh, move our economy forward as we seek to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic. So I kind of want to go over the COVID-19 policy 
um, timeline and the rollout and how that impacted small businesses. On March 4th, Governor Gavin Newsom had declared a state of emergency within California. A few days later, March 7th, the Riverside Public Health Officer had declared a local health emergency. By March 11th, the World Health Organization had declared COVID-19 a pandemic. A few days later, March 17th, Orange County had banned large public and private gatherings. And by March 19th, Governor Newsom had announced a statewide uh, shelter at home order. So obviously we can see from March 4th to March 19th, that's a very short amount of time for so many policy, um, you know, introductions and small businesses, minority owned, women owned, they did not have the time to adapt to all the changes these policies had. And it was very challenging for a lot of women and a lot of businesses to kind of grapple with the changes that the new policies brought forward. So as we can all infer, Latina businesses were not immune to pandemic closures. Many women were forced to temporarily shut down their business, while unfortunately others had to permanently shut down. And for all business owners, particularly Latina entrepreneurs, there were a lot of mental health challenges that resulted from the pandemic and these policy rollouts. So now I really want to do a deeper dive into the mental health impacts the COVID-19 policy rollout had. And I did two case studies for my research project, and now I'm going to explain those all to you. So the first business I looked into was called Magnificent Balloons. The owner was a 20-year-old new business owner. She operates primarily within the Inland Empire. And as you can see in the photo, her uh, business is primarily making balloon garlands for special events. Here are just a few more photos so you kind of understand more of what she was doing. So in our interview, she shared that she had a really unique experience with COVID-19. She actually contracted the virus in the early stages of the pandemic. And because of her experience with COVID-19 in particular, she has a lot of new anxieties uh, surrounding her business that have really impacted the way she goes about uh, you know, her business model. She's implemented a lot of new health and safety policies. And even though gatherings are no longer banned within Orange County and Inland Empire, she still has a lot of safety measures in place to stop the spread of disease and protect herself and pr protect her employees. So um, really just her experience with COVID increased her exposure to anxiety and it uh, kind of created space for mental health challenges within her business that she didn't have to take into account before. In addition to her own uh, individual experience with the virus, she shared that she's had a lot of additional financial stressors that have arisen because of changes in um, pricing for a lot of the products she was able to get before the pandemic. She shared that a lot of the goods are more expensive now. There are a lot of shipping delays because of international kind of supply that she isn't able to really control. And uh, overall, she is just making less profit than she was before because things are more expensive. She has to wait longer for her products to arrive. And these new financial stressors have overall just uh, prolonged her exposure to stress and anxiety. And these were um, mental health challenges that she did not have before the pandemic. So moving on to the next business I interviewed, it was called Deluxe uh, florista. The owner, again, was a new business owner. She was 30 years old and she operated primarily in Orange County. Before the uh, pandemic, she did mainly picnic tables for special events. So you can see in the picture, they're just kind of like aesthetic, uh, like picnic sets uh, for small little events. But because of the pandemic, she kind of had to switch her business model. Now she does more like floral arrangements like you can see here. So for weddings, birthdays, whatever you can really think of. And um, similar to the first case study I just shared with all of you, uh, the owner of this business also shared that things are just more expensive now. She's having a harder time getting the supplies she was able to get beforehand. It's cutting into her profits and it's really adding to the stress she feels as a business owner. One thing I really want to highlight about this business is um, she did look for programs, aid programs from the government, but because she is a very new business, she wasn't eligible for a lot of programs such as PPP loans. And even when she did find a program that she was eligible for, there 
there are a lot of bureaucratic barriers that prevented her from applying. Uh, applications were very long. They were very dense. She didn't understand them, and she didn't really know who to go to to get help and assistance for these applications. So there were a lot of barriers that prevented her from kind of addressing the stress she was experiencing as a business owner. So moving forward, I want to address how we can support diversity within entrepreneurship and more importantly, the role of policy, private interest, and civil society overall. So as we can see, there are a lot of policies enacted during uh, the pandemic that obviously need to, needed to be implemented, but these policies also had adverse effects on minority-owned businesses and Latina-owned businesses. So as we seek to kind of rebuild the economy and move forward, it's important to address how new policies need to be implemented that can aid minority-owned businesses. And um, a lot of people before me today uh, and also right now are discussing the role of social equity programs within the public and private sector. And I just wanted to highlight how we can potentially use these models and implement them to aid uh, future women in their entrepreneurial journey and kind of help us rebuild the economy. And overall, just learning as a society how we can address mental health as a legitimate policy issue and encourage our legislators to um, have a discourse around the role of policy and mental health and how we can address certain stigmas within communities of color that prevent um, you know, addressing mental health challenges and how overall we can come together and not only support women of color by you know, buying their products and supporting businesses, but how we can really help communities of color prevail against policy issues and um, really just support everyone as we move to uh, uh, rebuild the economy from the pandemic. But that was everything for me. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Um, we will now turn it over to Jill, um, our respondent, to give feedback to the students on their presentations and their research. You can yes. you can sit yes. there. That microphone is on. Perfect. Can you hear? Awesome. Uh, so I want to thank you both for your presentations today. I really appreciated the amount of research and data that goes into telling these stories, as well as the case studies, which really help people connect to the real world experience that people have had. Um, you know, when you talked, Erin, I like the fact that you gave the comparison to the prior um, recessions, right? Like, why was this one so different? Why did it impact people so different? And I think that's really helpful to level set and get people clear on why this was such a different experience. Um, I like from there that you focused on the sectors that were impacted and you know, thinking about also that, that lack of teleporting, tel tel telecommuting, and being able to think about retail, but in person was hindered, online wasn't, but who was employed in those two different sectors is really relevant. Um, the, I also liked on a couple of things that you touched on, and, and kind of my takeaway from your presentation is more questions, right? There's only so much you can cover in the time. Honestly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's what you can cover in the time, but it prompts some questions like, why were the amounts set at 5K to 25K? What was the logic behind that? What, did it have any basis in what people's actual needs were? Who got the higher end? Who got the yeah. lower end? You know, questions like that. The, just as briefly, yeah. the, the lower amounts were for smaller businesses, and the higher amounts were for larger small businesses. So and, it, and the, it was based on their own revenue streams, but just to, to keep it equitable to their business models, I suppose. But still, I, I don't think it took into account a lot of different things regarding the size of the company and the composition of who worked in those companies. Exactly, and I think that raises the question of where was the need greater? They focused on who was employing other people yeah. as opposed to single entrepreneurs without any employees where this was their sole source of income and they, they didn't have employees, maybe their revenues were smaller, but it was more essential, right? So if you looked at it from a need-based perspective, would there be a different criteria? So I think that's one of the things to take away from your presentation is really questioning the assumptions, right? Questioning the criteria that was used and then um, asking if that was the right criteria. Is there other criteria? It also caused me to think about what data we had and what data we didn't have. When they developed these policies, were they thinking about how 
entrepreneurship was distributed, right, across these different populations. And what were the different types of businesses? Because if they understood, you know, the size of the pie that was being impacted by, you know, individual entrepreneurs, maybe they would have reflected on a policy specific for that audience. Right. Um, I think uh, the failed infrastructure is really interesting question as well. When you start to think about, you know, who has the time to sit there and fill out these forms? Who has the social capital and the navigational capital to go out and get support in figuring out these online uh, programs? And then the financial capital, right? Who knows the people at the bank? Who can help them fill this out? Who feels comfortable even going into the bank and having those conversations? Um, and what are the required documents? Why are those the required documents? How, how difficult is it to get those required documents? Yeah. So, yeah, so. Businesses that opened before they had sort of a year to collect tax forms on that business were not eligible for the loans because they didn't have any sort of tax records for their business. So that includes, like, business, new businesses are already struggling and now they're not eligible. So, yeah, you, you try to encourage new entrepreneurship, yeah. but then you don't support new entrepreneurship. And what's important to think about in, in both of your cases is the fact that the pandemic didn't really create necessarily new problems. It exacerbated existing problems, right? It's shown a light on gaps where we weren't providing support and assistance in the first place. Um, to your point about like new entrepreneurs, we're not providing an ecosystem that provides support. There was just an article um, from uh, Anne Marie Slaughter called Renewal. Take a look at it because part of what she's championing in there is that everybody should have the ability and right to innovate, but that some people have, you know, you know, friends and family with means who can support them and others do not. So how can the government play a role in providing safety nets and almost a trampoline so you can try and you can still bounce back, right? You can have that second chance. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on for you was childcare. So you, you mentioned that as both a symptom and a cause. <laughs> um, and I think that that's really huge. So another thing to think about from policy recommendations. So when you present like this is like, what's next, right? Is to think about how can we create a safety net for childcare? That's fundamental across the board for women in all sorts of jobs. And there is a, a huge gap there where we don't have any sort of standard or support. So when women have to deal with kids at home, it's obviously cutting into their ability to work much more so than it has impacted uh, the men, unfortunately. Um, and single parents. That was another thing we, I don't think you touched on, but that's another group that, you know, is forced to be innovative and entrepreneurial yeah. to, to pay the bills. And so how do we really support single parents as part of that child care conversation as well? Um, Allison, so what I liked about yours is if the focus on public health and mental health, it's something that's often quite overlooked. And yeah. in this period of time, we're all experienced collective trauma, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just individual trauma, it's a collective trauma and it's a compounded trauma. We had Me Too, we had Black Lives Matter, we have Asian hate, we had refugees, we had like literally one thing on top of another. And so people yeah. are feeling very impacted mm -hmm. and they're also um, loss of control, right? Like, yeah. and so this, COVID and the impact on these businesses, like they lost the control of their income. They lost the control to even make some of the decisions yeah. uh, around the financial inclusion. Um, your, you know, your point about unintended consequences, like they had to take these policies in place for the health of the larger community. Mm -hmm. But now that we've been through this, what do we learn from this experience? How do we do things differently going forward? Or what supports should we be putting into place right now? Yeah. There was um, an article that was saying that, uh, let me find this quote because it's quite interesting. According to a survey of 1,200 women business owners, nearly half of these new businesses started during the pandemic mm -hmm. were started by women of color. They were more than twice as likely to have started a business out of economic need. Yeah. So this isn't ending, right? Like this isn't like, okay, pandemic happened yeah. and now we're coming out of it and everything's gonna be okay. It's we need to start thinking about these new businesses that are starting out of need right mm -hmm. now. What do they need? How yeah. can we support them? We need to be actively um, interacting and, and being intentional about these new businesses that are coming into the fore. And what, what do we think about, you know, entrepreneurship that's, you know, started out of need and what difference do they need as opposed to people who elect 
to start a, a, yeah. a company. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I uh, was also curious about um, when you talk about mental health and anxiety and compounding anxiety, what do you see as opportunities for government to, to intervene in those areas? Yeah. Um, one of the things I really wanted to explore within this project was kind of how policy, when we use it to address a public health issue, we generally tend to think of physical health, something like a communicable disease or, you know, something chronic that you go to a doctor and you get diagnosed for. But I think mental health and particularly mental health within communities of color is very much taboo. It's not addressed. Um, you know, being like a Hispanic woman myself, mental health isn't something that I grew up discussing with my family and things like that. So I think anxiety is something that a lot of business owners carry and they don't understand how to kind of engage in dialogue and discourse about it. So one of the things I really wanted to get across with this study was just kind of encouraging legislators, uh, private interest groups, and just, you know, we as like general people, um, you know, kind of engaging in these conversations about how anxiety impacts, you know, me as an individual or someone as a business owner engaging in these conversations and addressing how we can potentially craft policies that um, create access to support programs because they're not always accessible, especially for communities of color. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. When you think about the Small Business Association, right? Mm -hmm. They provide resources for people starting companies. Could mental health resources be part of what they provide? Could they provide classes? Could they provide access? I know, you know, access to small businesses is actually kind of a holy grail for a lot of businesses. Like they want to reach entrepreneurs and founders of small businesses, but they're hard to reach because they're working 24-7, yeah. right? They're working into the evenings. They're not in... They're not congregating in one place where you can go talk to them. Um, at one point, I was working on a startup that was interested in this area, and they would try to partner with Costco because a lot of small businesses have to go buy in bulk there, mm, yeah. um, which reminded me about you know the point about supplies, right? the cost of supplies. Is there something the government do, could do to buy in bulk to reduce the impact of the increased costs or the delays in the supply chain? What is the role there, um, and is there an opportunity? Um, I also think about Detroit. So Detroit, Michigan, when the car industry went blew up, they actually went through and they removed as much red tape as they could from the entrepreneurship startup process because they wanted people to stay and they wanted them to start companies. And so the first thing they did was kind of strip down the regulation and requirements. So that's another thing to ask is, you know, what can we do to make entry into entrepreneurship a little bit easier? And then as you scale, maybe you take on more and more of the regulatory responsibilities, um, I think is a really interesting part as well. Well, um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to touch on. Uh, you know, this whole issue of, of gender, of course, and women in particular, when they're, you know, asking for these resources and supports, they do get different reactions. I think about like women and venture capitalists. We actually train women founders to reframe questions in their mind because they're often asked questions in a different way that puts them at a negative or deficit. So like, uh, you know, venture capitalists want us to learn about your team might ask a male founder, tell me about your team, and then might ask a woman founder, how do I know you can do the technology, right? Yeah. Like there's just a difference in tone. And so I think there's this broad opportunity to make sure that people get an equitable experience. And we're seeing some interesting startups where, you know, getting loans that are not predatory and are based on more simple criteria can be done online where you don't face kind of some of the power barriers and, and bias uh, issues. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's the big thing is for you to leave people not only with like, here's what we've seen, here's what we've learned. Based on this, here's where we can go. Here are the next big opportunities where policy could make a difference. Or we don't have to have this happen again. We can actually plan now for the new companies that are being started during COVID. So yeah, I was really impressed. And uh, I really enjoyed all both of your presentations. And I'm excited to see where you go forward from there. Thank you. I'd like to open up to any audience questions. Does the audience have any questions for our panelists? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I have one. I have two. First one for Allison about the party planning. I thought that was actually a really 
interesting one because I think through like not my personal experience, but through people I know that's an already stressful and competitive industry. Mm -hmm. And then when you add a pandemic, that really obviously just throws it off its tracks. I can't imagine that. But did they? Did a lot of them? I know you touched briefly on it, but if you could just expand on like how maybe their mental health in regards to their profession was different before the pandemic versus now. Like that that you did touch on, but that concept was so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I think obviously um, the party planning industry as a whole is very competitive. Um, you know, the weddings were canceled, birthday parties canceled, all of that. And I think um, the majority of my interview centered around how it was really challenging kind of navigating how all these, you know, like events that were happening and it was so competitive, how it went from that to basically overnight, there was nothing and they didn't really have anything to do for their business for months. I think both of the businesses I talked to, they were kind of shut down like yeah. indefinitely. And that obviously had an impact on their mental health. They started questioning, oh, well, maybe I should go into something else. And for the second business, I um, touched on it briefly, but originally they were doing like picnic tables and stuff. And it was more of like a gathering kind of sort of event. And she had to switch her business model completely to be more floral arrangements so she could just drop it off and whatever, you know, it was for. It wasn't necessarily for an event. Um, so there was a lot of... Um, changes they had to adapt to very quickly. And I think having to adapt so quickly with very little support had a really big impact on their mental health. And they're still trying to address it now, um, how you know they can move forward and still support themselves as individuals, but also support their business and you know their entrepreneurial goals going forward. Yeah, yeah. and I also had a question for, oh, by the way, both, love both of your guys' presentations. Like this is something I never had even really thought, like, you think about but you don't really like mm -hmm. have the opportunity to delve into it more and I think you guys just provided like amazing context to the topics that you were researching and I've learned so 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 much um, but Aaron I had a question about so these businesses that you were taught there were a couple that you said you did Kate you used as case studies did they express or were like super aware of like this gender disparity because I know certain, sometimes people are in, they'll be experiencing um, hardships that they're not aware that they're, that, that there's people that aren't experiencing that. Do you know what I mean? Like they're right. not aware of like this gap. So I'm just really curious if like they were aware of that and if so, how did they express it and what did they feel like they needed that maybe others were getting and they weren't? Right, I think that, um uh, well, I don't want to speak on behalf of these business owners, yeah. but knowing that they are occupying spaces in the business sector that are female dominated, cosmetology industries, retail, that did have to experience incredibly, incredibly high rates of closures for months on end. And because of that, we're not able to retain a lot of their employees throughout all of that. Um, I think they felt sort of a frustration and maybe felt like they were being not targeted, but like definitely disparately impacted by the closures, um, maybe even more than say restaurants or like retail that could pivot to online. Um, those companies were able to sort of continue services and adapt in a way that certain industries simply couldn't at all without like their in-person services. Um, and so I think that knowing that you're in a sector that is facing sort of some of the most difficult challenges of the pandemic definitely compounds sort of the mental health challenges that Allison was talking about. Um, party planning includes that too, you know? These type of, of industries could not really adapt in the same way to the pandemic that other industries were able to. And I think that, um, like I said, the Cal Relief Grants tried to touch on that, but I don't think they definitely did that well enough. And I don't think that they were focusing um, on businesses that couldn't adapt in any sort of way to the pandemic as much as they could have. I think that's an interesting question. What else is different about in-person businesses versus those that can be done online? Going forward, what is what are policies and things that need to be done to support them? Are there other things that go beyond the impacts of COVID that we should be thinking about? Are these sectors, do they have different requirements 
you know, if they're in the, you know, the hair business or in these different businesses, should the policies be the same for all businesses or are there legitimate reasons to think about recrafting different policies for different sectors? Yeah, I was curious to know, um, I know uh, both Aaron and Allison, um, there are like different nonprofits and there are different like groups and like, community groups that focus on women, um, women entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs as well as just like women employees, like working mothers. And I was curious to know if you had any information on what these community groups and nonprofits and what initiatives are doing during the pandemic to support. Um, I know there was a lot of shortfalls, but I was wondering like on the other end, what what they were doing during the pandemic to help support these women. Yeah, I can answer that a little bit. I definitely looked into some like minority owned or women owned business communities that um, their main goal was sort of educating about loan programs um, and sort of trying to reduce inequities in those resources, knowledge about them and, and knowledge on how to complete them, um, which I think was really important. Um, as for childcare, I'm not really sure. I, I didn't come across anything like that um, because the childcare industry itself was forced into closures, um, which just <laughs> compounds all of this. Uh, but yeah, those are definitely a great network of support for small women-owned businesses. Yeah, I think um, the role of nonprofit organizations and the support they can provide to women in business is something that the businesses I interviewed did not explore. They were mainly looking into kind of government relief programs, loan programs, stuff like that. And I mentioned this a little bit. They had a lot of barriers, just, you know, like bureaucratic barriers. They didn't understand applications or they didn't know where to find these programs. And I think one of the reasons for that is because they didn't have access or they didn't know how to access these kinds of organizations. Because obviously they do exist. Southern California is a very populous area and I'm sure there are a lot of them that were willing to um, assist these businesses. But, you know, they're um, their potential wasn't really realized with the two businesses I talked to, and I would honestly be interested in learning more about what organizations are available within the Orange County and Inland Empire and how we can connect uh, small businesses like the ones I interviewed and you know get them the support that they need moving forward.